Good morning. This is another of our in our series of skills development sessions. And as you know, the purpose of these sessions is really to help you be a more effective and efficient individual, but also obviously to be more effective and efficient within the working environment. And the particular skill set we're looking at today is quite a mouthful. It's called action research. Now the advantage of action research is that it is a methodology that's been developed and it evolved amongst the teaching profession, but it's a methodology for improving your own personal performance. So it gives you a structure and it is a solid research methodology. People do their PhDs using this methodology. So it gives you a structure whereby you can develop, do your own personal and professional development but it's based around applying this methodology either to solve a problem or to introduce an innovation into your private or your public life. So action research is also important because you all know the quote from Einstein. It says insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Well, action research is the opposite. Action research is about introducing something in a, such a structured way that at the end of the cycle you will be 100% clear whether your innovation or the problem you were trying to solve was successful. So as I mentioned, Action Research is a professional development tool that allows you to introduce new ideas, in other words, innovations into your personal or your work life, or it's a methodology whereby you can solve a technical problem, in other words, solve a problem that you're dealing with again either in your private or in your public life and as i mentioned it's if you apply it consistently and if you stick to it through a few of these cycles then it becomes a personal development practice in other words it becomes something that allows you to become systematically more efficient but what action research is about it's all about taking action while you are in a methodology that allows you to collect information Obviously, if you are tackling a big problem or introducing a big innovation, you're going to have to be much more structured. You're going to have more documentation around what you're doing. If you're using the same methodology to improve a personal or private situation, you might be a bit more relaxed in terms of your documentation. But the thing I want you to remember is it's all about taking action. It's about doing things. Now, it's important at this point to just reflect a moment and stop and think about what is the difference between action research and perhaps more traditional research. And I, I sometimes find with some of my students that the word action research, the research part in that term, often frightens people off because they say, I'm not a researcher. I've not been trained in research methodologies. I don't know how to develop a protocol. Don't let this put you off. Remember what I said, this is a personal development tool. Just a personal development tool that you deploy in such a way that it allows you to collect evidence because that's largely what research is. Research is about collecting evidence and analyzing that evidence and coming to some form of a conclusion. So action research, what, where it differs from perhaps traditional research methods is that the focus of the research is yourself. In other words, you are researching yourself. It's not like a traditional research project where you go out and you research them, right? What would be a traditional research question? What is the incidence of high blood pressure in the community? Then you go off, you get a sample in the community, you go and take their blood pressures, and then you can answer that question. Yeah, it's a, so instead of doing research on other people, you're going to be doing research on yourself. The second point is, it is a process of learning while we're doing things. We spend every day, our whole day, while we are awake doing things. So why not use that process of engaging our intellect and using a scientific framework to understand if what we are doing is actually making a difference. Are we doing the right things to achieve a positive outcome? And it's all about collaboration because a major part of action research is an interaction with our peers. And we do it instinctively. So if you set yourself a New Year's resolution and you said, I am going to lose weight 
this year, we incline to discuss that with people. And as we start exercising, as we start eating better, as the scale starts telling us we're losing weight, we are inclined to share this. And it's the same thing in action research. We are going to do action research in a collaborative environment. We're going to talk to people. We're going to involve people in our action research because whether we're improving our personal and our professional environment, there's always people in that environment. And most importantly, there's a social intent behind this. The moment you ask the question is, how do I improve my work? Or how do I improve my community? Or how do I improve the environment I live in? The impact of what you're doing starts going behind you and it starts benefiting other people. So why do we as an organization promote action research? Is because we are continuously striving to do things better smarter and more effective. And action research is exactly that. It is, for all intents and purposes, a cycle of continuous quality assurance, right? So it's continuous quality improvement, but what are you improving? You're not improving the quality of a product out there necessary. You're improving your own quality of work that you're doing. I touched on the social intent and what we see in the social intent is how it plays out is really through a fourth step process. Firstly, if you start changing your own practice and your own way of working and if there's a growth component to it, if you're doing things better and smarter, you will start contributing to the development of other people. And with so many of these sessions that we've done, you, there's always this concept of once you've learned something, You've got to start practicing it and you've got to start teaching other people. So even if it's just the indirect effect of doing things more efficiently and the fact that it's a more efficient work environment makes things better for your colleague, that's one way of doing it. But if you really embrace this methodology and if you start seeing the benefits, teach it to other people. The third step we're starting to see is people start becoming more innovative because the more they solve problems and find different ways of solving that problem, they are drawing on innovation and they start becoming change agents. And that's what we see, want to see. So in step four, what we see is people start becoming transformational leaders. In other words, they affect change in their organization. And remember, if you reflect back on our leadership session we did, we pointed out that every single person is a leader. That leadership is not something for people in high office and in high positions. But that what we see is that if people get into this habit of systematically affecting change, positive change, and they can understand that they've made a difference, is they effectively become transformational leaders. And you will remember from our leadership session, we said leadership is something that applies to everybody. Leadership is not something that's reserved for people in high places or in political roles, but that every single one of us is in a position to be a leader on a daily basis in our interaction with our friends, our family, our environment, our community and our work environment. And the reason why people become transformational leaders is that it becomes almost a drug. Once you can see you can improve things, very difficult to walk away from that. So I want to share a little story for you that applies to me very specific. Many, many years ago, I was in a diplomatic position. I was appointed as the South African health attaché in our embassy in Geneva. And my job after almost 30 years of isolation was to engage with the international community and normalize relationships. And in working with the World Health Organization, I ended up going to meet with the uh, Maternal and Child Health Unit. And I received a very hostile response when I arrived there. The head of that unit, who was a very eminent pediatrician, said to me, Oh, you from that country that deliberately allows babies to die. And I said, I'm not sure what you're talking about. He says, you don't use oral rehydration for babies with diarrhea and therefore they die deliberately. And I said to him, actually, I don't know what oral rehydration is. And he said, but what type of doctor are you? And I said, oh, I'm a medical doctor. He says, but how could you not have heard of oral rehydration? He says, how do you guys treat the baby with diarrhea? And I said, well, that's easy. We put drips up. 
And as you know, babies are fragile. So they often get diarrhea, and at that stage, that's how we'd been trained. Because we'd been in isolation, a lot of the international trends had not reached us. Now, oral rehydration is a very simple method whereby if a baby's got diarrhea, the mother at home can make sure that baby doesn't die by giving them water. And it's boiled water with a certain number of teaspoons of sugar in it and a small amount of salt in it. And that mixture gets given to the baby and it prevents them from dehydrating because loss of fluid, dehydration, is what kills babies. But I'd never heard of it. We went through this incredible difficult process of putting drips into babies. And normally the only place you can put a drip on a baby is in their skull. There's a little vein right here in the front and it's difficult and technically difficult and you've got to sit there and watch the baby because they're so small you can't let the drip run too quickly. And this guy said, this is you nuts. This is not. The rest of the world is using this other process. So I, they gave me the whole orientation kit which was everything from policies through posters to advertise it and I'd send it through to South Africa and within a few months that became government policy. The program was rolled out and in the first six months, four and a half thousand less babies died of diarrhea in the country. And the real number is probably bigger. But that moment for me is when I realized what the importance of, of affecting change. Because suddenly I saw that I could have practiced my whole life as a doctor and I would not have saved the number of lives that I saved by one intervention, just acting as the person who introduces the innovation and follows it through to ensure that innovation rolls out. And that's what makes people transformational leaders because they become addicted to this example. Now, the example I used is a big one. It affected a country. But in the same way, you can make small changes that affects one person, two person, 10 people, 100 people. You will never know where it stops. Now, at this point, it's worthwhile to just focus on a quote. And the quote is from Socrates. He says, the secret of change is to focus all your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. And you've all heard of this thing, resistance to change. And I don't want you to Go into action research blindly. Remember, there's always resistance to change. But what makes action research so wonderful is you only have to overcome that resistance in yourself. Because remember, the only person you're trying to change is yourself at this point. So once you've committed to it, once you've said, I'm going to embrace this process of affecting positive change, normally there's not that many obstacles. You just need to not give up. But remember what's also important is you need to, before you tackle something, do what the scientists call a literature review. Just go and Google. Whatever the problem is you want to address, whatever the innovation you want to introduce, make sure that the plan you're coming up with is not a plan that other people have used before and that has failed. Because as Einstein said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them. So if your problem is that every January after the December holidays and the festive season, you're out of money, you've got to commit to doing something differently. Because doing the same thing will always guarantee the same results. And this also adds to a very important thing around action research. I mentioned it's a cycle. And it's a cycle that we're going to discuss in a few minutes of planning, acting, observing, and reflecting, and that reflection is incredibly important. Because reflecting, looking back, understanding if our intervention was successful, will prevent us from falling into this trap. So, leading on to the action research cycle. The action research cycle really, as I said, starts with the point where you identify the problem that you want to solve, or the innovation that you want to introduce. And then you go through four steps. And they're really straightforward. You've got to develop a plan. If I want to solve a problem, I've got to have a plan. You then have to act on your plan. It doesn't help that you've got a plan and you've got all these wonderful New Year's resolutions, but you never get around to actually doing something about it. So you've got to start acting. You've got to implement your plan. And that, most of us now. Now the other two important steps come in. 
You've got to observe the effect of your plan. In other words, you've got to collect and analyze data, right? And don't get put off with it. Remember, you're researching yourself. So some of the data will just be the normal data that flows around you. If your objective was to lose weight, the scale is your source of data. But if you don't weigh yourself, how will you know if your, if your, your plan to lose weight is working? And then reflect an important that's added to that share. In other words, reflect on this. What worked, what didn't work? And we're going to dig a bit deeper into these things. The interesting thing about action research is that when you get at the end of a cycle, when you reflect, it's time to begin another cycle. And there can be multiple cycles that spin off this thing. In other words, once we've gone through this process of planning, acting, observing, reflecting, the question you've got to ask yourself in that reflection is also, what do I do next? And this is how one gets into that cycle of total quality improvement. And the reason why we want to practice this process over and over again, something we touched on in leadership, and that's a quote that's probably two and a half thousand years old now, from Aristotle who says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but it's a habit. Because the more we do things, the more we repeat these cycles, the more they become habits. And the moment they become habits, it's almost a subconscious process where you will always apply action research in your life, in your work environment. So right, step one, we said you have to plan for your innovation. How do we plan? People often come and say, I'm not sure, how do I get to understanding what the problem is? Well, it depends on what your aim is. If your aim is to innovate, the questions you're going to ask are slightly different to whether your aim is to solve a problem or resolve the issue. So if I'm going to innovate, the questions I ask is, what am I doing? What do I need to improve? How do I improve it? Right? What's the innovation I'm going to introduce? If it's a problem, then the problem is what is the problem? What is my concern? Remember, because it's got to apply to you. It's a problem that you're dealing with and it's a problem that you can fix. Why do I see this as a problem? Right? And again, what is the plan? What intervention can I do to address this problem that I'm facing? Now, at this point, it's just really important for me to bring in a little bit of realism into this conversation. And that's around defining the scope of your influence. If what concerns you is world hunger, be realistic about what effect you can have. I know people can have catalytic effects, but just think carefully about, is it in your influence? How much of this problem I want to tackle is within my position to influence. And the second thing is about creating mandates. Often people want somebody to tell them to do something. But remember, here you are doing a project on yourself. So the only person who has to tell you to do something is yourself. So it shouldn't be a problem for you to get a mandate, and it shouldn't be a problem for you to be realistic in terms of the innovation or the problem you want to fix in terms of the scope, the largeness, what you can achieve. Even if your ambitions are high, start in a, at the local level. Start affecting change in an environment where you've got influence and then see if you can build it up to reach a much bigger audience. Right? And in conclusion with our planning step, this quote is important. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Most people go through life without having a plan. Most people depend on other people making plans for them. Part of action research is adopting this methodology so that you take control of, of the situation around you. You define what are the problems you want to fix and you define what innovations you want to do and you start realizing that you are the change agent. Next step, act. Now the most important thing in terms of acting is to write down your plan. In the planning session you've said this is what I want to do. If what you want to do is a big program, you're going to need a more complex work plan with timelines and resources and all of that. But if it's a small thing you want to do, write it down still. In one of the previous sessions, we talked about time management and we talked about how important it is to have a list of things to do. So do the same thing with this. If your goal is to lose weight, set a target as part of your planning and then put the steps down 
and then start acting on those steps. And as you complete those steps, as you achieve those milestones, tick them off. And remember, every step of the way, we want you to reflect. Share, talk to other people, explain what worked well, explain what didn't work well, but think about what you're doing and think about what was successful and what was unsuccessful. That brings us to step three, which is observe. Now, I've been suggesting that you observe from step one, and I've suggested that you reflect from step one. But it's important when we observe to try and verify that what we are observing is correct, because there is a thing called observer bias. If we strongly believe that we want to find, make a certain change, we might start convincing ourselves that we're seeing that change, we're seeing that resolution and not being objective. So that's why you've got to collect evidence, right? And that's why you've got to observe. And a good method is something called triangulation. In other words, it's not just what you are seeing, but you're asking a few other people to also provide evidence that you can understand whether the evidence you are collecting is objective. So here's a bit of a, uh, the example I've got you on the slide is within our educational practice. So as an organization, we, on one of our courses, decided instead of having people write exams, we're going to give them a practical action research project to do. So these were senior managers. They were in an environment where they had authority. And at the beginning of the year, we said to them, we want you to, during the year, apply your knowledge to solving a real problem and collecting a portfolio of evidence. In other words, collect proof that that intervention is either successful or unsuccessful. Now, from our side, the innovative idea was that if we create an environment that almost force students to apply their knowledge, we're going to end up with students that are better managers in the end. So how did we triangulate this data? We spoke to the faculty, to the people who were marking assignments that were coming in during the year. And they said, we're getting much better quality assignment. We spoke to assessment specialists, the ones who were more marking the portfolios. They said, you know, we're seeing here people are affecting change. We sent questionnaires to the students. We said, do you like this or don't you like this? We spoke to their supervisors and said, are you seeing a measurable difference? And the end result, what we became convinced of, is that this intervention was much more better or much superior as an assessment methodology than asking people to write exams. And at eventually we saw it through a longer term study where, that we did where we saw about 75% of the students who came through these courses were within the next year or two promoted to more senior positions. So just that switch, that innovative idea, because we introduced it, because we put it into an action research cycle, because we collected evidence on this through observation, we knew that this was the right way to go. So the last step is reflection. And reflective practice is something we should be doing every single day. People who've done research on happiness have found that if people spend five minutes at the end of the day just reflecting back, and what's reflection? It's just thinking about things. And if they just think about what happened during the day that was positive, they find that within a short period of time, those people are substantially happier. They found the same thing with people who are depressed, that, that on reflecting on positive things, they become less depressed. So reflection is important in our professional and our personal practice. So what do we reflect on? We reflect on the process we went through. We reflect on the end result that we achieved. And we reflect also on our personal development. Because remember, the reason you're doing this is to develop your professional practice. And there's a whole bunch of reflective techniques out there. But it's all about questions. What happened? What did, what did I experience? How does that influence me? What am I going to do different going forward? So that is what reflection is. And obviously, as your project moves through these steps, you reflect on each component. In the end, you reflect on the success or failure of it. And remember, if an if a innovation you're trying fails or plan a problem you're trying to solve you unsuccessful, 
it is completely acceptable to have an unsuccessful result. We don't always get it right the first time. But I'm sure you've heard this quote that says, if you're going to fail, fail fast. And the action research cycle, through its focus on observation and reflection, allows you to quickly determine success and failure. And if it was a failure, start something new. Start a new cycle. If it was successful, then build on that success to create a new action research cycle. So remember what I said is you want to really reflect on two things. You want to reflect on how did my little project influence me as a person? And you want to reflect on how did it improve my performance, my knowledge, my professional side of things. So you can reflect on what you did, what you didn't do, what you should have done different. Any question that allows you to get greater insight into yourself and into your profession. Thank you very much for your time. I hope that this little session will add to you becoming a more effective person. Remember what I said, don't get put off by the word research. This is a personal development tool. It's a tool to develop yourself and your profession. Thank you very much.